Good afternoon and good morning. My name is Monica Pika. I'm with SACS Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Firstly, on behalf of Philips and SACS Communications, we want to thank you, thank all the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping all of us through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to all of you. I also want to show our audience how you can send questions in throughout the webinar. Our speaker will try to answer as many questions they can at the end of the presentation. So please type your questions at any time into the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen and click Send. If you are having technical issues, please press the Tech tab on the right-hand side of your screen and submit your question that way. If for some reason you cannot see the slides, please use your Chrome browser for the best experience and make sure you are not behind a firewall. To refresh your screen at any time, if you still cannot see the slides, please click the F5 key if you are using a PC or Command R if you are using a Mac. Handouts can be accessed from the Handouts tab at the bottom of your screen. Please scroll to the bottom of your screen to access them. Our moderator is James Simmons. Dr. Simmons is currently an acute care nurse practitioner at UCLA Ronald Reagan Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. He is a guest lecturer at UCLA School of Nursing, Master's Entry Clinical Nurse Program. Dr. Simmons is an adjunct leader, lecturer, acute care nurse practitioner program, uh, University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing, a co-host of Drop the Subject, a nationally syndicated talk radio program on radio.com. He has been featured as a health expert on numerous television, radio, podcast, and social media programming. Welcome. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Monica, for that very kind introduction. That was so nice of you. <laughs> so the title of today's webinar is Patient-Centric Monitoring, Using Technology to Enhance Patient Care. Speaking today on this very timely topic is a dear friend and colleague, Cheryl Lahuke. Dr. Lahuke is currently Project Management Specialist in Operations at UCLA Health in Los Angeles. She facilitates system-wide implementation of evidence-based solutions to support safe patient care environments. In 2017, Dr. Lahuke developed and led clinical education and clinical operations teams in the implementation of a system-wide physiologic monitor exchange to a patient-centric model. She has presented at numerous nursing meetings related to patient monitoring and is an active member of several organizations, including Association of Nurse Leaders. Of course, our speaker has disclosed no conflicts of interest associated with this presentation. This activity has been approved for continuing education, which is great. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour for nurses and respiratory therapists. A link to obtain your certificate will be available at the end of the webinar, and for your reference, the accreditation statement is listed below. Support for this educational activity has been provided by Philips. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Cheryl Lahuke. Thank you, Dr. Simmons, and greetings all. I am thrilled to share our UCLA journey with you as we developed and implemented a patient-centered physiologic monitoring model. As a UCLA clinical liaison, I had the opportunity to critically assess how we were doing business and really align our processes with what we said our mission and vision were. Oh, my apologies. Um, in the learning objectives, I hope that you'll come away with some little nuggets on how to develop a patient-centric monitoring model, including um, development and implementation, the components of a patient-centered model, and help you um, with your implementation should you be going through that process and discussing the mobile incident command strategy. When we talk about patient-centric, it's a little bit of a buzzword in healthcare, right? We say, oh, we're patient-centric and we do patient-centric things. But if you look back at the Institute of Medicine and really dive deep into it, are we doing practices? Are we completing our, our care um, that is respectful of, responsive to, um, and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values? 
and ensuring that these values guide all clinical decisions. And this was the challenge that was given to me when I took on the role of changing the physiologic monitoring system. Um, we were to meet our mission and vision and values, and this was to be our true north. Um, and subsequently, it's not all about the patient, it is all about the patient, but the subsequent fallout is that you can improve your patient satisfaction scores and your staff productivity and actually reduce overall cost of care. And we were able to do that. I really like how uh, the New England Journal of Medicine refers to the four C's of patient-centric care. And they address issues such as culture, like I mentioned, the mission, vision, and values, and the leadership um, core value and focus that we had with our system, and I'll review that in a bit. But then also, um, does the care focus on physical comfort and emotional well-being? And are we including our patients and families in decisions um, that when we make changes in the health system? The collaboration piece was huge for us. Um, we included our patients and families, and because our model became patient-centric, meaning it moved throughout the entire hospital, we had to critically assess how we were speaking with each other across levels of care, and I'll go through a little bit about that, and then communicate, 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 as with any other change management model. I just want to share a little bit about UCLA Health so you can understand the scope and, and the vision that we were working with. We have two campuses. Uh, we have over 800 beds, and we see a large number of patients. Um, I put the number of staff in here because each one of these staff members was um, workflows were changed by changing our model, influenced heavily, and we had a lot of their uh, in feedback as we developed our process. The one thing that I really want to focus on is our patient-centric vision, however. This is our true north. And I love saying it, it gives me chills every time and because I just feel that it is really the core of what I wanted to do as a nurse. The vision for UCLA Health is healing humankind one patient at a time by promoting health, alleviating suffering, and delivering acts of kindness. And every decision we made was filtered through this lens. Is it promoting health? Is it alleviating suffering? And is it delivering acts of kindness? And if it wasn't, we needed to figure out how we could make that happen. Another little piece that I wanted to share with you is as we were doing this project, we already have really, really high patient satisfaction scores. We're blessed to have been in the 90th percentile for over a decade. And that is while we are running at an extraordinarily high census. So for the leaders on this call, you know that running at an 85% census is a really solid place to be managing a health system. This is our screenshot from last Tuesday, and we are running at over 100% come every Tuesday. So this was gonna be a very complex um, change, and we were, we were not gonna be able to close down any rooms, and or wings to make our monitor exchange and things needed to happen extraordinarily smoothly so that we didn't impact our patient satisfaction scores. We had some very basic patient-centric goals to start with. We were replacing a 20-year-old legacy system. It was a hardwired system. It was a culture of me and mine. Um, we were to do that with no care interruptions, patient care interruptions, no patient, family, or staff complaints. This is a lofty goal, and um, we were thrilled that we were able to meet it. I'll show you how. We were able to standardize our configuration so that our processes were standardized across the health system. We found um, much variation as we started our process. And we also, in having a, pa a patient-centric goal was to have confident and competent staff, to have staff saying, well, we don't know how to do this or we're not sure how, like, why did this happen, wasn't going to instill confidence in our patients. And we were to have no adverse patient events, whether they be infection prevention or data loss. And how we did this was optimizing synergy of best practices in multiple departments at UCLA Health. And I have had the pleasure of working at the bedside and in several departments and several projects and was able to pull together the key elements of successful programs to, 
to identify our current state. So we use lean PDCA. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the lean model that came from Toyota originally. Um, but this is our change management strategy at UCLA, and we use the PDCA process. I'll review it shortly. And standard work is key elements of our change management. In addition, we had rolled out um, our electronic health record several years before in the largest epic Big Bang go live to that date. And we will use, successfully use super users in that model. And the classroom model for that was also mimicked in this project. We pulled together our quality uh, improvement team's failure modes effects analysis process so we could identify every element that could possibly fail and mitigate for it. And during our implementation, we applied the daily incident command structure that we use and you may often use as well for emergency preparedness. If you're on the West Coast, we have earthquakes. Um, for those of you in the South, you have uh, weather-related things. So using that incident command structure was essential in our go lives. Going back to lean PDCA, um, people often think that the plan, do, check, act, or plan, do, study, act, or equal amounts of, of the process. But to be honest, the planning, which I'm going to review primarily in this presentation, took us over a year. From the time we chose our vendor to the time we put in our first monitor was exactly a year. The do, the check, and the act are really important features where we go back and say, did we do it well? How can we do it better? And standardizing and sustaining that process. So just to give you a, an example of how we were doing business before, we had a, an obsolete system. It was hardwired. We had uh, monitors in every room in the intensive care units, but we had monitors on roll stands in our med surge units. We did not have a monitor in every room, and this was causing delays with our throughput and bottlenecks in our perioperative areas and our emergency department. And you've already seen our census. So you can imagine how disgruntled the staff were in both of those areas not being able to move a patient because we didn't have a monitor to get them to. Um, this was also the culture of when we moved our patient, you took them to the room, you flipped up their gown, you took off all of their leads and hoses and cables and took your equipment back home with you. It was a, created a culture of hoarding and a culture of mine and this was determined to be not patient centric at all. So this was our baseline. And um, we had a lot of opportunities to change and, and to really move with the technology and the times. The hardwired system was very limiting and we had the opportunity to change to a Wi-Fi enabled platform. And that was um, the, the basis for most of our changes that we were able to make was having being freed up and not being tied to a wall. In the first year, we, we did a critical assessment of the current state. And what does that mean? Um, I look back at my minutes or my calendar and we did over 48 hours of walkthroughs and observations. Uh, this was an interdisciplinary team. This was with our vendor and our teams. And it's amazing what happens when you bring your IT team to the front line and they see a patient process and they're like, well, why do you do it that way? Having the fresh set of eyes on processes that as nurses, we were just used to seeing as normal in the way we do business and critically assessing that was essential. During that time, we interviewed staff, we observed the workflows and we talked with our patients and families. We also have the opportunity to engage our PFAC groups, patient family advisory council groups. Um, those folks are often people who come and go in the health system and, and are really invested in making it better. And we received some great ideas from them about what we could do when it came to alarms and, and making the monitor more friendly for mobility. We also reviewed our HCAP survey scores. Um, there are comments in there that were related to monitors and we included that as well. Um, so when we're looking at a patient-centric monitor, we had to get the patient voice before we could uh, develop a future state. So the current, um, current state 
assessment used the patient voice at a very high level. And then we developed our future state uh, with the goal of optimizing our new technology, as I mentioned, the Wi-Fi platform, and integrating functionalities that just weren't present 20 years ago when we put in our first monitors. I'm going to go through um, a couple best practices that we used. Um, you may be familiar with some of these terms and or use something similar. Um, I'm going to go over process mapping and how we employed that, failure modes effects analysis and how that was essential in our planning. Uh, we're from Los Angeles, we're very close to Hollywood, and we're very fond of doing dress rehearsals. So that may be something that you haven't done in the past, but might be something that would be worth integrating moving forward. So I'll discuss that. Um, super users, our vendor told us, were the secret sauce in our project. And I'll review um, what we expected of our super users and how they actually saved us a significant amount of money in our installation. Um, I will go over our true-to-life education model and then show you how we developed and implemented our incident command structure. Process mapping, you probably think post-its, post-its on post-its with lines and triangles and bursts of where things aren't working well. And that's exactly what we did. We did hours and hours of walkthroughs and then we all sat down and said, what flow did you see? What was working? What wasn't? And from the patient experience, we had different color-coded items, but if it was a patient voice or a staff voice, we put that in as well. This is a, a process that we use at UCLA regularly, and um, we found extraordinarily effective to define processes. The failure mode effects analysis assessment was completed by our Department of Quality as a, their partnership with us in this new um, implementation. And it looks like there's a significant number of people on this, in these meetings, and there was. And it was really important to see the different perspectives of this process on, um, on, on what we determined and called a patient safety project. This wasn't changing infrastructure. Um, this wasn't just putting in new monitors. This was a patient safety process. And because of that, we included legal, compliance, marketing, clinical, including nursing, operative services, respiratory therapy, and some key physician leaders, um, our clinical engineering department, materials management for the bits and pieces, probes, et cetera. Our infection prevention team was essential um, when it came to looking at our processes and making sure that we could put something in place that would meet our infection prevention guidelines, environmental services, and of course, our patient experience team. And after several um, days of drafting the process and scoring, we came up with the top risk priority areas. And we felt that we, with the number of people that we had doing our exchange and moving our patients around, we had some issues with hand hygiene and proper PPE, which now with COVID would have been an absolute nightmare. Um, thank goodness we did that before. Um, technical issues, including expected and unexpected issues with data transfer, and then, of course, just patient and family satisfaction. So this was a tabletop exercise that occurred over four sessions, so it was a significant amount of time. And then what we did is we took what we learned from, from our tabletop exercise and did a dress rehearsal. So in the photo on the right, you see what appears to be a patient. She was actually a volunteer from our volunteer services department who agreed to play the role of a patient. And we went through the exact process of what was going to happen when we exchanged the monitor with the patient in the room. So keeping in mind that we were not going to be able to shut down a room or a unit or a wing to, to exchange our monitors, we were going to have to do it with the patient right there. So this person provided the voice of the patient, and we also had um, membership from our legal and compliance teams, IP was watching. And it gave us a chance to really look at our roles. Were we doing what we said we were doing? Were we communicating as we said we were going to? And what was the impact? It was a huge concern about the sound. Was this going to be an extremely noisy process? 
So we had the voice of our patient um, volunteer giving us her perception of did she feel like she could answer questions? Did she feel that um, people were talking over her? Did she feel like just a body when they were changing her cables and leads? And then we also had a decibel meter and other subjective, um, I mean objective, um, ways of looking at sound and the impact. We also were able to look at, because we had to pick a room when it showed up, whenever it showed up, we were able to look at how this was impacted um, R and MD rounds, um, what was happening with hand hygiene, especially in the NICU where the rooms are delineated by curtains, not walls, and we were able to look at our data management. We did this in the ICU, the NICU, and a med surge floor. And it wasn't just about the processes. We had heard from um, previous installations at other hospitals that they had to shut down on their first unit because they didn't have the right probes and cables to match the monitor. And I was convinced that that wouldn't happen with us. And we did a consumable stress rehearsal as well, meaning every probe, cable, sensor was plugged in, plugged into the monitor and um, we tested to make sure we had all of the right pieces to go live. Coming from our FMEA and our dress rehearsals, our marketing team created a very um, succinct document that was handed to the patients and to the staff. The patient one was given to the patients and family the night before so that they were aware of what we were doing and had the opportunity to answer questions. And then we realized that even though we'd been working on this for a year as a team, the other 1,700 nurses in the health system hadn't had the intimate experience with what we were working on. So we had a frequently asked question sheet for them as well. Our super user strategy was our secret sauce. And as I mentioned, this was originated with our electronic health record go live when we hired 400 plus people off the street to train, to help the trainers in the classroom and provide at the elbow support. And this was evidence-based from the literature. This is something that has worked very well for electronic health records, and we thought it would work well for us. What we um, recommended was that each unit have a unit-based super user. This is normal for every electronic health record upgrade or things that we do, new pumps in the units. But we also had a dedicated team, and that was where we really excelled. I was able to recruit 30 people from our float pool to only work with us as we move forward with the installation over four months. And their requirements for training were significant. Um, they were to attend one class for their own competency, participate in at least two more classes of the same acuity at, with the goal of understanding what the frequently asked questions were or the sticking points were of staff and to get more hands-on experience. They were to provide out-of-ratio go-live support for the day the unit went live. Those were the unit-based super users. And knowing that we could be running at 105% capacity and not have the staff for out-of-ratio support, the float pool super users provided 24-7 support as well. We also use uh, an item called the roving sandbox. You may be familiar with this if you have Epic or have done electronic health record go live. These are monitors on roll stands that we just rolled around so people could touch them without fear of causing problems with patient data or with a patient or in a safe place where they could ask questions where they weren't doing it in front of a patient. They also provide, uh, participate in ongoing education by our vendor after our system implementation for the next three months as requested. And in addition to that, in the very beginning, this probably should be line item one, um, they completed the computer-based training, which was three hours in advance. These folks were indeed completely super, and our vendor said they have never seen a group that was so engaged and owned the process as tightly as ours did. In the classrooms, um, they, were, they helped us with the classroom setup and development. They helped us with our scheduling. It was a large amount of staff. We scheduled over 5,000 people within two weeks of their go-live date, and our go-live dates ranged over four months. So this was very tight. 
Um, the other thing that they did a great job of was developing tip sheets, um, the sort of the IKEA version of how to do things the quick with with um, little elements of photos and and just the tips that they really needed to move forward. And as we went live, as soon as we went live, I could no longer manage the classroom. So I did have one or two that stayed behind and managed the classroom. Our super users were involved from the very beginning. From the time we chose a vendor, they were involved in our FMEAs, they were involved in our walkthroughs, they were involved in our education, and they felt that they truly had ownership in the process. Our classroom model was based on our EPIC model, where every um, person who attended had their own monitor, and each room was fully integrated to represent a patient unit. We had to convince them that moving a patient from one unit to another using a smaller, much smaller monitor would actually transfer the data. So we had two central stations, which mimicked um, a, each a unit, and the staff were able to move, shift their patient from one unit to the other um, using that model. And it really helped them understand um, what, besides the buttonology of the monitors and those patient safety items, what the flow would look like. And then we got to the do. So the planning took a full year and was a full year of weekly meetings with the interdisciplinary teams and daily with me just working through the, all of the potential failure modes that we identified. Um, our timeline expectations were tight. We were offered a 1.5 year install and we, that was not going to work with us. So we were able to um, get that down to four and a half months and we firmly believe that was related to all of our planning and our super user strategy. Um, we had implementation teams, they were dedicated 24-7 uh, super user support and I'll go over the mobile incident command. This was just a sample of what was left um, when we um, had finished a unit, there was dedicated phone lines and, and an escalation strategy all the way up to um, our vendor hotline. Our mobile incident command center was the element of that we used to make sure that when we went live every day in a different unit that we could address our issues in real time. It was our central communication hub and it was how we completed our incident tracking and follow up. As I mentioned earlier, we had two teams. This included our vendors and our clinical um, clinical engineering and technical teams, and they work together um, throughout the entire um, in implementation. So team one was team one, team two was team two. And in our command center, we had our vendor and site project managers. We had a command center administrator who kept track of all the calls and documentation. I was present every day as the clinical representative. We had a clinical representative from our vendor as well. Clinical engineering and IT um, support, we call them ISS, um, were also present in the room. So all the key elements, if we had reached anything that wasn't working, we could escalate in real time. We had the right people in the room. Um, this was just an example of a very simplified standard work. We had to limit our communication at the bedside because we didn't want to interrupt our patients. Um, at, we want to interrupt them as limited amount as possible. Of course, they did have some questions and we were able to answer those. But we would call into the command center and say, we're starting room one. And then we would wait in the command center. If something that couldn't be came up that they couldn't handle at the bedside, um, they would escalate it to us during the install. And then they would call us at the end when that room was completed. And that included anything that they were able to address during the installation. So it's a very simplified version of our communication, but there wasn't a lot of coming and going on, that, on the communication. Um, our standard work for the command center, it was mobile. We weren't in a fixed location every time. So each unit that we went live with, we had identified a room in advance that we would be able to take over for 
six to eight hours. Um, it's usually in the clinical area, the huddle room, or where the staff meets in the morning. And we were able to answer any questions in their daily huddle before they started their day. And then we took over their space for about eight hours. Um, we were able to address all calls and all walk-in concerns. And we escalated when required and everything was logged. And an example on the right was the complete list of our first day's issues in an intensive care unit, a quaternary care transplant unit. And it's, if you can see it, if you can open it up, the majority were able to be responded to and addressed in less than 10 minutes. And I firmly believe that's because we had the right people in the room at the right time. And we were able to um, address everything in real time. Nothing was left. And at the end of the day, um, we closed out as many issues as we could before we came home. We also had daily report outs to the units who had already gone live. We had a bridge line set up. They could call in. How did it go today? They could say how they felt it went. Um, if we had any patient comments, we would include those. And then we would have our perception from the command center and from the vendor as well. The key element that I think that was really essential for our command center was the ability to stop the line. And this is one of those terms um, from lean methodology, pull the and on. If you're in a process and things aren't going well and you think you could produce more errors further down line, stop the process and address it. I'll give you a little example of what happened on Valentine's Day. So we'd finished our eighth floor, four units a week before. Everything went well, able to address everything in real time. We started with our seventh floor ICU. And for some reason, this happens extraordinarily rarely, we transferred someone from our seven ICU to our eight ICU, and the data didn't flow. And we stopped the, the line immediately. We got a call, data didn't come through, and this is us at 11 o'clock at night on Valentine's Day, and it took us until 11 p.m. to sort through, was this a clinical issue, operator error, was this a technical issue? If so, was it on the vendor side? Was it on our side? And um, we were able to sort it out and go home. The only break we took was the calls to our significant others to say, sorry, we're going to have to reschedule our plans. Um, but this was the commitment we had to making sure that we um, met everything we said we were going to do and Valentine's Day wasn't going to hold us back. So pulling the and on didn't happen very often in our process. It happened twice um, where we really had to stop the line and reassess the situation. Everything else was able to be addressed in real time using our incident command strategy. What do you need um, for this? It's not big and hairy as you think it might be. We had um, dedicated laptops and chargers that we had on a little mobile cart. We had dedicated VoIP phones that each role was assigned, so the numbers did not change throughout the implementation. We had a bank charger for those. We used the whiteboards in the rooms um, where we had them, but not very often, so we used those large post-its with markers to keep track of things. We had a shared drive with a central location for our command center tracker so we could keep track of what were the things that kept happening? Could we send out frequently asked questions, um, information ahead of time, and what did we need to close out? And what we did find is the location matters. So in our one facility, we were able to find a room in every unit, very close to, if not in, every unit that went live. But our other facility, which is older, the space was at a premium, and we had a central location for our command center through their entire install. And no matter how much standard work we had and how much we had done this in the past and we had it really wired, it just seemed that if we weren't close and readily available, um, we, we had processes drop off. So it's just something to think about when you're doing, if you're setting up an incident command for, for any, any type of process is the location really does matter. Going through the PDACA cycle again, we are on ACT. And so as we were implementing, as we were doing in some units, we were checking and adjusting in others. 
our super users did an excellent job of working through the frequently asked questions, what parts of the workflow were so embedded in the way we do business that they required additional tip sheets and huddle messages and things like just-in-time training. So this is a great example of an IKEA tip sheet that our super users created with how to match our orders with our 12 leads, which was a process that we adopted as we changed monitors because the technology was available. And the, the vendor exchange or the change to the physiologic monitors has really been the gift that keeps on giving. And we've had ongoing PDCA cycles right up until this day. Um, we are doing ongoing review of workflows uh, what's working, what's not, what could be made better, listening to our staff on that. Our patients are very happy with our new monitors. Um, during the COVID response, we were able to incorporate some new processes in a more expedited manner. They were listed as down the road that we would implement, and that included remote control of our ICU monitors from um, our PCs and in, in the alcoves in the ICUs, which was an incredible saver when it came to uh, use of PPE and our patient sanity when it came to alarms. So we were able to adjust our alarms and also um, run blood pressures and 12 leads from outside of the room without even going in if, it did, if you didn't need to. We also implemented um, 12 leads in all of the units. We had the functionality, we just hadn't done the education yet because we were still using the old-fashioned carts but we had concerns from our ECG techs that they were being exposed unnecessarily and if we had the functionality, we could and should be able to implement that and we did. And starting next week, we're gonna be rolling out our single patient use ECG lead sets. That's also a patient-centric um, infection prevention strategy that's taken us a while to adopt, but we're getting there. Also included in PDCA cycles include our software upgrades and other integrations with different devices that come online. And we're excited to follow the same process as we roll out our capnography, CO2 mo um, monitoring in our med surge areas. So before I go over the impact on the patients, I wanna to explain to you what it looks like as a patient when you come into UCLA now. If you come in through the emergency department, you're greeted, you go through triage, and you're put on a monitor for either vital signs or continuous monitoring. The monitor is a larger screen with a smaller portable device that contains what we call, um, the monitor is called an X3. We call it X3 plus three because it has to be catchy and memorable, and that includes your 10 lead ECG cable, which has the ability to do 12 lead your blood pressure hose, and your pulse ox. Every monitor has that with it and it travels together. So you go, come into the ED and you've had chest pain and you need to go to the cath lab. We remove the smaller portable device with your three cables, move it with the patient to the cath lab and dock it into the cath lab monitor where it assumes the cath lab configuration, but it's still the patient data. The patient is admitted through the electronic health record and data flows to our electronic health record wirelessly in real time. Now the patient needs to go to the OR. We undock the monitor, they go to the OR, uh, plug it into the OR monitor, that it follows them through until they're discharged. Our monitors are capable of doing physiologic monitoring, everything from, well, I can't even remember how many waveforms for invasive pressure monitoring, all the way to purely vital signs based on the configuration that we choose. So it is their vital signs monitor, their physiologic monitor, and their personal 12 lead machine. So the patient experience, how did we impact the patient experience? Uh, we went from a culture of mine, a unit-based culture, to a culture of it's the patient's monitor, it's the patient's device. Um, we have no unnecessary exposure of patients during transfers when I was talking about we to expose them, take off, open their gown, take off all their leads, put new ones on. And when that happened, we had lapses in monitoring because sometimes the receiving unit wasn't ready, didn't have the things, they, the items they needed. 
um, our data transfer is now available in less than 30 seconds from the time you dock. And you can see it on your transport monitor in real time. But it's not a transport monitor, it is the patient monitor. Just to clarify, we moved from vital signs machines that move between patients and were considered an infection prevention concern in our transplant and quaternary care patients to a personal vital signs machine. And this has reduced the concerns in our patients and our IP department in our high-risk patients. We also had transport monitors in the past. These were extraordinarily cumbersome and very heavy and had caused um, some injuries to our staff in the past. This monitor is much more mobile, it's only seven pounds, and our, we have great patient satisfaction with their mobility with this monitor and staff satisfaction with the transportation process. We also heard from our patients in our planning that they, there were some alarm fatigue concerns for the patient. We also heard that from the staff. And in our planning, we were also able to take advantage of the, the opportunity to optimize and standardize our defaults to something that was more reasonable based on our historical data and our alarms. And we were able to reduce our alarms in the health system. This is an ongoing process going through about its third PDCA cycle right now. But what about the staff? I mentioned in the very beginning that a patient-centric monitoring model would impact the staff in a positive way. So historically, we had monitors and transport monitors and vital signs machines and teleboxes and 12-lead machines. And you never knew where they were and you could never find them and were they clean and, and, and it really was cumbersome for, patient, for staff to move patients and monitor patients. So we have shifted to a single monitor and cable set at each bedside. Um, this is a cost avoidance for those um, leaders in, on the call who are looking at opportunities to reduce costs. So we're able to reduce purchasing of additional equipment and all of the data goes directly through to the electronic health record, where it be vital signs machines, 12 leads, or physiologic monitor data. Um, historically, RNs were required to transport our monitored patients um, because there was no other way of seeing them remotely. Um, we've looked at the best evidence and used our uh, sister campus as a baseline, and we we're able to use our monitor text now to, to track our transported patients via Wi-Fi, and the vast majority of them that transport do not need a nursing accompaniment, and we have a policy and exceptions and escalations for that. Um, this has reduced RN coverage issues. Our physicians are happier that their patients are transported to tests in closer to real time, and the, the limit is the testing area, not the nurses required to transport. We're also able to review data um, in real time, whereas before it was very complex to look back through and identify in real time what was happening with the patient or even over the past 90 days. So we've got more transparency and ease of reviews. What was the impact of the health system? Oh, we had hoarding cable costs, cable costs related to hoarding um, that were just embarrassing. So people were, the units were buying up cables because they were convinced that people were stealing their cables. This might resonate with you if you have a, a process in places like that. We have um, now one extra cable set in each unit should something break, and this has dramatically reduced our cable costs across the health system. We used to have a bottleneck in the ED and perioff, as I mentioned earlier, and because we didn't have a monitor in every room, when we put a monitor in every room with the capacity to do physiologic or vital signs, the only rate limiting step in moving our patients now is our capacity issues. So that was a very exciting for our ED specifically, who are waiting for monitored patient availability. And then our charge capture and upload of 12 leads to our electronic health record was variable, and we've been able to optimize that technology um, to match the order at the bedside and transmit it directly to the electronic health record, reducing printing, increasing visibility, and now with COVID, it's great because you don't have everyone in the room looking over a piece of paper and handing it over. This has been an exceptional um, opportunity for us as well. And we feel that our challenge was met and exceeded. 
not only did we have an on-time transition um, of a physiologic monitor to a patient-centric monitor across the health system, we had no care delivery or throughput delays related to our process. We had no patient or family concerns. We had a single patient that went to the patient affairs department. He was an engineer and he was interested in what type of Wi-Fi we were using, but nothing related to the process, concerns about losing their data or any items like that. We had no reported infection prevention lapses with hand hygiene. We did not lose any patient data, which is thrilling. Our staff felt confident and competent um, when they were um, in, and supported during the exchange and that we completed a survey on that. We had a 15% response rate, was, which was extraordinary for us. And we identified 10 more clinical opportunities to standardize further and make the process even better from a clinical perspective. I firmly believe that our keys to success were executive laser focus on a patient-centric model and going back to our vision and having our executive leadership say, is it healing humankind one patient at a time? Is it alleviating suffering? Is it promoting health? And is it delivering acts of kindness? And if it isn't, we need to figure out how to make that happen. Also framing the project as a patient safety project rather than a device exchange or just we're just putting in another monitor, I think really focused people on the, the fact that this was related to patient safety. I believe our vendor relationship was extraordinary and we shared our vision with them and we worked together to make it happen. And then capitalizing on the interdisciplinary synergy and the best practices that we had employed at UCLA health historically was also essential to our success. Um, I hope that you were able to glean some nuggets of, of um, what we did and how you could adapt to be, develop a patient-centric monitoring system, even if you aren't doing a full-on exchange. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. And I thank you for your attention. Before we continue on with our question and answer period, I'm going to turn the presentation over to James, who will let everyone know how they can obtain their CEs for this session. Dr. Luhuke, wow, that was impressive. I work at UCLA and I use these monitors every day. I had no idea everything that went into it. That was amazing. So thank you for uh, this very thought provoking presentation. You have a lot of questions, so I will let you rest your voice now um, and get ready for the remainder of the hour. We will answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, but before that, a couple of housekeeping items, which will also answer some of the questions there in the Q&A. Um, I would like to remind the audience how they can obtain their CEs for this activity. So this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. To obtain the CE credit, go to saxtesting.com slash BO. That's S-A-X-E testing.com slash BO, boy operator. You will need to register when you get to that site. Once you're there, complete the evaluation and upon successful completion of that evaluation, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. And again, to remind everyone, support for this educational activity is provided by Phillips. A couple of other housekeeping items. There is an archived version of this very presentation that will be on demand um, at better-outcomes.org, better-outcomes.org. When that is available, an email will be sent to each of you that registered for this. So you'll get an email that will ping you and let you know that that is available. And of course, this is lovely, that on-demand version will also be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists for your CE. So with that said, all right, Cheryl, I hope you rested your voice. We have um, some questions for you here, and it looks like we have about 10 minutes to get some of these questions done. I, I'm going to couch a few of these questions together, Cheryl, because there seem to be a, a, several questions about how the alarms were calibrated for the patient and the patient bouncing from unit to unit, let's say, 
or from mm. the cath lab to to the ICU, to the OR, back to the unit, et cetera. So think of that in your mind. And then I'm going to read a couple of these questions because they're all sort of, a, they have the same theme. So uh, one person asks, are the alarms able to be fine-tuned to each patient? And then a follow-up to that, each unit will have different settings for alarms and defaults, so won't work on different units. I think those kind sure. of, I think you can probably answer both of those together. Sure. So, yes, um, you are able to fine-tune the alarm limits at each bedside related to your patient's uh, condition, but we also um, were able to modify all of the defaults, the standard defaults, um, to meet the criteria of, of the industry standards, but also our patient population a little bit. So we're, we have a standard configuration for med surge. Um, where our parameters say our low heart rate is 50 and our high is 100, but you're able to modify that. When you move your smaller monitor and dock it in an ICU monitor, the parameters are different and standardized to ICU. Similar to the cath lab, and the monitor takes on the configuration of where it is docked at the time. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, the, the larger monitor that the small monitor that's mobile is docked into takes on the configuration of the unit. The unit um, defaults were standardized. ICU across the health system, everyone agreed. A standardized med surge, standardized PEDS, standardized PICU, standardized NICU. So we have standardized configurations across the system. Are those alarms that reset? in between patients, Cheryl? Yes, they are absolutely reset between patients. And just to give an idea of how much of that six month or one year planning phase this took, this took six months of our planning phase was just defaults and coming to consensus. That's incredible, but lot, lots of lean, uh, you know, uh, going on there for sure. I love that, that to see that there. A lot of you have asked, by the way, where the uh, archive version of the of, of this will be and where you can go to see um, to get that. So we're going to bounce back on the slide here. The archive version is available at better-outcomes.org, better-outcomes.org. And then just so you can see as well, to obtain your CE, I'll, I'll keep this up here for just a moment. You will go to saxtesting.com slash BO, and it's up on your screen there for you. Um, Cheryl, uh, a, a patient-centric question, and, and I love this. Yeah. Um, what, what questions did you ask to assess patient family experience with the telemetry monitoring? And I think this is across, this, this is across the spectrum of sort of before when they got the, the leaflet that this was coming during the process and then immediately afterward. Um, so, uh, immediately afterwards and before or in the planning phase as well. I'll start with planning phase. Um, we had patient family advisory councils. These folks are, are kind of frequent flyers. They're patients or family members that have come to us several times in the health system and have a very good idea of how we do business. And we started out with this is how we monitor now. How was your experience? And we really left it open, and we sat with them for at least an hour with each group, and they gave us feedback on what was working, what wasn't, what they'd seen at other hospitals if they'd been there. Our marketing department did develop that tool in advance, um, so we handed it out to our patients, and the staff were able to answer questions um, using our frequently asked questions document, but if there was anything that they didn't weren't able to answer, we went to those patients' bedsides and, and spoke with the families in advance of, of us actually changing any monitors in the health system and made sure they felt comfortable. They were able to ask questions at any time during the process. It wasn't like, uh, now be quiet, we're, we're changing your monitor. Um, it, it was definitely an integrated process. And keeping it for sure patient centric. I love that all the way through the entire process. I love this question. It's something I hadn't thought of. Cheryl, did the Wi Fi bandwidth have to be upgraded prior to implementation of new monitors? 
So I wish I had my technical guy with me. We did do um, Wi-Fi heat mapping across the health system and went everywhere a patient could go, either walking or in transport. And there were some upgrades that were required related to our heat mapping. Um, there's a beautiful window that we have that oversees the ocean. And our patients often go and stand by that window and it was a bit weak in the Wi-Fi and our signals were dropping out. So we were able to optimize in that area. Additionally, we like our patients to go out on the balcony and or the patio outside um, and they go with their monitors and that was buffed up for the Wi-Fi as well. So there was a, a little bit of optimization that was required, but, um, but that was supported by our technical team. Great question. Absolutely. Just as a reminder to everyone, we have just about three more minutes. There are a lot of questions. So unfortunately, we're probably not going to be able to get to all of your questions, but there is an archive of this, as well as there'll be opportunities for you to uh, be able to reach out to Dr. Lahuke um, to ask more questions. Um, a couple more, Cheryl, before we, we wrap. What was mm -hmm. the total timeline of PDCA to implementation, and how many months are you now past go live? Okay, so our planning from the time we chose a vendor to our first monitor going in was one year. The, the ongoing PDCA cycles are ongoing right up until this date. Um, it took us one year to plan, four and a half months to install, and it's been coming up on three years since we put in our final monitor. Wow. What was that process for vendor selection? Um, that was an RFP, so request for proposal. We work with a large health system and we are under constraints of a large health system to go through processes um, and contracting. So it was a, a very competitive bid process, but the key element that when we presented it was we are going for a patient-centric model. So when I mentioned that working with a vendor with a joint vision, that was essential for us in our vendor choice. I love this question because I'm someone who sees these monitors fly all over the hospital. Do, does UCLA have RFID to track the equipment? <laughs> um, we do have RFID to track the equipment, but given our, um, our high level of acuity and our capacity issues, about 85 to 90% of our monitors are actively on patients at all times. So they're easy to find. We have had um, two tele boxes go out in the laundry. I think that's probably standard process, but with our major monitors, we have not lost a single one. Wow, and three years past go live, that's fantastic. Um, Cheryl, just there are other questions here, unfortunately we're not gonna be able to get to, but the, you also have been given a lot of great feedback. Um, people are saying that this was excellent. You've really inspired them and given them some great ideas. Uh, so, Dr. Luhuke, thank you so much for um, everything that you've shown us here and given to everybody here. Um, again, there will be opportunities for you to um, earn CEs from this as well as see an archived version. And with that, I do want to, there's just a couple more housekeeping things that may answer some of your other questions as well. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Monica for concluding remarks. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. And this does conclude our webinar for today. I would like to remind you and remind the audience that there's a survey for you at the conclusion that will pop up immediately, and we would greatly appreciate you sharing your opinions on today's webinar. We thank you, and on behalf of our presenter, SACS Healthcare Communications, and our sponsor, Philips, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so very much. <laughs>